Pioneer is a program of innovative orthopedic networking, e-learning, education, and research that was designed to fill the gap left by the absence of face-to-face -face meetings, courses, and other activities during the 2020 coronavirus pandemic. But Pioneer has become so much more than this in the intervening year. Pioneer is a virtual, but also very real community of like-minded orthopedists striving to help not only themselves, but one another. With the latest video conferencing and educational technology, as well as a groundbreaking online platform, SICOT's Pioneer events, activities, and resources are reaching every corner of the globe, with over 55,000 views of our webinars so far. We're forging new partnerships, signing agreements with 12 other international academic societies, and building an enduring network we hope will last for many years to come. So, what can you expect from us? Free webinars led by key opinion leaders from around the world and across all fields of orthopedic surgery and traumatology, as well as chat shows with some of the most interesting and inspiring surgeons on the planet. Opportunities to take an interactive role in these webinars by participating in polls and live discussions. Free on-demand Pioneer playback service. Watch our webinars again and again in your own time, and coming soon. Our new bespoke learning management system will host podcasts, an online version of the famous SICOT Diploma Exam, virtual training modules, surgical technique courses, a discussion forum, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us on this pioneering journey as we push the boundaries of what is possible in online orthopedic education together. Right, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Vikas Kanduja, consultant orthopedic surgeon in Cambridge, UK, and one of the founders of SICOT Pioneer. And it's indeed a pleasure to welcome all of you logging in from various parts of the world to this webinar. Now, in the COVID world of non-contact domains, which is when we started SICOT Pioneer, we've certainly embraced digital competitiveness with the launch of this platform. And through this platform, we've done over 50 events with five tete-a-tetes, and we've had over 80,000 views from 110 countries around the world. So a big thank you for joining us and following us as well, and please continue to do so. Now, today's webinar is certainly very close to my heart, uh, starting in hip arthroscopy, and we're ever so grateful to Oliver Marine Penner and Mark Tay from the, and the HIP committee, along with the stellar faculty that they have actually got from all around the globe, who've given up their precious time to come and teach on this webinar. And I'll let Oliver and Mark introduce them to you in a minute. We'll try and make this as interactive as possible. So please do post in your questions. And if you can't join us today, then we've had this recorded and you can access it via our on-demand platform. Once again, a big thank you to all of you for joining us and hope you enjoy this webinar. Oliver, over to you and Mark as well. Thank you, Vikas. Thank you so much for uh, your support to these uh, activities of the HIP subcommittee of uh, CICOT. And let me introduce you this webinar. This is the third webinar that we organize uh, within the HIP subcommittee. And it's a great, ple a great pleasure to start with this preserving surgery. The previous uh, webinars have been uh, uh, talk about complication in hip arthroplasty. Another one with the Indian Arthroplasty Association that was so successful about hip dysplasia and total hip replacement in that cases. And this third webinar will be focused in preserving surgery. Our committee actually is trying to uh, overview the 360 degrees approach to the hip. And one of these approach is preserving surgery. And in this case, today, we are going to talk about hip arthroscopy. Indeed, the title of this webinar is how to start with hip arthroscopy in a safe and effective manner. 
and it's my pleasure to collaborate with another subcommittee of CICOP. It was the sport subcommittee with uh, some uh, uh, delegates here mm -hmm. in this in this session. And uh, as I told you, it's a great pleasure to collaborate with all the SICO team to approach the hip. And in this case, with the hip arthroscopy. So I will very shortly introduce you uh, the colleagues that will participate in this webinar. First of all, my co-chair of this webinar, Mark Tay from Barcelona. Mark, welcome. And also, I would like to introduce Femi Ajeni from Canada. He's a very well-known surgeon that will talk uh, later about some med medicine-based evidence. Manu Odenard from Belgium. As you have seen, Vikas Kanduja from UK. Sassender from uh, India. And Hatton Said from Egypt. These are the first block of talks. And after that, we'll have a very huge discussion, as I said, because please send questions. That's so important. In the second part, we will moderate two cases. It's a case-based discussion. And there will be some questions within the case. So please, you will have time to vote the different questions that you will see during the case. And we will discuss the main topics related to these two cases. And... Uh, now, I will introduce uh, again Mark Tay, the co-moderator of this uh, webinar, that will introduce the talks and the speakers. Mark? Mark, you are mute. You need to unmute. Yeah. Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark Tay from Barcelona. Thank you very much for the introduction. And we'll start with our with our webinar. And the first talk, unfortunately, um, Dr. Ayeni could not be online with us, so it will be a pre-recorded uh, talk. So we will start with the evidence medicine approach to hip arthroscopy surgical indication. The main thing that we must know when we start doing hip arthroscopy is to know exactly what are the proper indications. So please go ahead. Uh, one moment, Mark, I think. Uh, Femi can say uh, hello and we can we can uh, put the video on. Femi, are you there? Thank yeah. you so much for being here. Thank you. It's a true pleasure to be a part of this webinar. Um, I'm clearly operating as we speak, and so I'm in between cases because of the time difference. But that being said, I wanted to congratulate the uh, organization for having such a wonderful uh, panel of experts to speak on very, very important topics. I have recorded my talk and I'm hopeful that I can join the discussion this afternoon. And with that, because time is limited, I will sign off. But really wanted to say thank you to everybody for showing up and for supporting this very important webinar. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here to speak about how to start with hip arthroscopy in a safe and effective manner using an evidence-based approach. I'm Olufemi Ayani from McMaster University in Canada, and I'm bringing my best wishes. Here are my disclosures. When it comes to the hip arthroscopy, there's been a steady rise and consistently across the globe, we've seen this essentially doubling every three to five years. And this is across multiple jurisdictions, as you can see in the um, graphs on the slide. Also in our publication several years ago, we found that hip arthroscopy is at a tipping point, which is to say that there is rapid adoption. It has moved past the early adopters and early majority phase. And in that S-shaped sigmoidal curve, you're seeing it really starting to grow dramatically. As well, the evidence for hip arthroscopy is also grown to support some of the indications for procedures. So what about the learning curve? And this is all about safety and starting on the right track. We published this paper several years ago showing that something happens around 30 cases in hip arthroscopy where you seem to understand the pathology, understand what is happening, and are safely executing your operation. It does not mean you are an expert, but around that 30th case, you are becoming more proficient and something seems to click. That being said, how do you start safely? Well, it all really begins with the basics, history and physical examination. No matter how good you are, 
technically or how much technology you have on your hands, you really need to go back to the fundamentals that we all use in medicine every single day. So John Cluhissi and his group published about symptomatic hip pain, especially regarding impingement, and groin dominant pain should be a key feature on your history. Without groin dominant hip pain, really think about what else could be causing this patient's symptoms. So in history, that is a key feature. Now we move to the physical examination. Understand that we have to examine patients because there is a vast differential diagnosis that can cause hip pain. And you can see that multiple systems from this diagram can be involved in the setting of somebody presenting with hip pain. So simply because they have groin dominant pain does not mean they need an arthroscopy. They need a significantly thorough and standardized clinical examination, which you should all do. Our examination is in five stages, standing, seated, supine, lateral decubitus and prone, and the key hallmark test for impingement typically is the flexion, adduction, internal rotation as you see in that video. That being said, we do need imaging to confirm our findings, and typically we start off with x-rays, an MRI arthrogram, increasingly with a three Tesla magnet, we do not use as many arthrograms. Regardless, in complex deformities or revision cases, a CT scan, and then an ultrasound if we suspect there are any abdominal or hernia-based findings, and then a diagnostic intraarticular injection is still very useful for our group. So when it comes to the intraarticular injection, we have shown that the intraarticular injection can be diagnostic and therapeutic and somewhat predictive in the sense that if you do not obtain relief or your patient does not obtain relief from an injection, then the likelihood of then obtaining relief from surgery is reduced compared to those who do not have, who do have relief. So a lack of relief is certainly a key feature in somebody who may not benefit from the intervention. So for us on our physical examination, history, physical imaging and diagnostic injection, and we publish this algorithm in Nature Reviews. If you have a history of positive groin pain, physical examination, imaging positive, diagnostic injection positive, these are the hallmarks of somebody who may benefit from your intervention. And so treatment, know your indications and also know your limitations. So we've published in surgical indications and there are many papers out there. I would encourage you to seek the evidence to look for clinical indicators for operative intervention. Also recognize that hip surgery is a team sport. As you have done a good history and physical examination and you're moving forward, recognize you need help. You need help from senior colleagues, pain specialists, radiologists who can really give you a good read on what's happening, as well as physical therapists who will manage your patients after you've operated on them. So really engage your team and always communicate. It's important to learn from your conflict patients. Benjamin Dome's group has published that experience is so important with this, and it may take hundreds of cases to really become proficient and an expert. And so that's by 30 being the basic to really obtain proficiency, recognize that complication rates, reoperation rates reduce dramatically as you increase with your experience. So the future of learning is global. We have recently completed some studies looking at how we look at impingement across the globe. And I think if we continue to collaborate with organizations such as Saigon, we'll be able to answer important questions about what are the indications and who we should be operating on. And this is an example of a Delphi study where we came together across the world to look at what are the indications, what are the complications, and what should we be looking at when we operate on patients. So I thank you for allowing me to have this platform to speak with you today, and I encourage you to consider these key conclusive um, points. The learning curve is not steep, but actually prolonged. The diagnosis of hip condition should include a history, physical, as well as good imaging and intraarticular injection. A team-based approach is important. Use the best evidence in the literature to guide your treatment and keep actively learning across the globe and engage all of your colleagues. And if you have that approach and strategy, you will have a successful HIP program from my experience and my opinion. And I thank you once more for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak with you all on this day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that this common team-based approach will be repeated during this, this webinar several times. Okay, next talk will be um, about hip biomechanics, in femoral stabular impingement, how to improve uh, with hip arthroscopy. Please, Dr. Abdenard from Belgium, go ahead. You can share your screen and 
start new talk whenever you are prepared. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is that visible? That's super. So, uh, hello everyone. Hello, Seekot. The purpose of, of this presentation is to elaborate on the mechanical aspects of the hip joint relevant to hip arthroscopy. My name is Emmanuel Aubnert and I'm a hip surgeon from Belgium. First of all, a big hello from Belgium. The topics I would like to address today relate to patient selection, patient installation, aspects of camera section, and finally, some thoughts on soft tissue management. So first of all, patient selection. When evaluating a patient with suspect FIA, we will first of all look for a CAM lesion on imaging to decide whether there is a clinical relevant CAM. So what is a relevant CAM lesion? Should we be more concerned about lateral lesions or medial lesions? Contact studies show the impingement occurs with different portions of the CAM during different EDL activities. So the bad news is all CAM lesions are potentially harmful. Equally important is to evaluate how the overall patient hip geometry is defined. And here, both acetabular and femoral morphotypes are relevant. Any acetabular geometry that brings the acetabulum in closer relation with the femoral neck is an increased risk for cartilage damage. Hands, deep socket, and acetabular retroversion are at risk signs. Similarly, any geometrical configuration that nears the femoral neck to the acetabulum increases the risk for harmful abutment. So both excessive femoral virus and femoral version will be radiographical aspects to consider. So in summary, when deciding on whether CAM morphology should be operated on, it involves evaluation of the CAM geometry, acetabular geometry, and femoral geometry, and all of these in a three-dimensional sense. Some notes on patient installation. To gain access to the joint, substantial traction force is required. In order to decrease the risk of skin lesions, in particular necrosis, a large well-padded post will be used to distribute the traction forces, and possibly some trending work will allow to pull against gravity rather than pulling the patient against the post. The average force requires mounts up to 400 to 600 Newton, which is huge. The question that is not often asked is why is the hip so strongly sealed, and is this maybe an important factor for healthy joint functioning? Consider an average leg weights 15 kilograms that makes already 150 newtons to carry during simply walking. Imagine that we add velocity to that mass, which will further increase the distraction forces almost 500 newtons during follow-up, follow-through in soccer, and even up to 1,000 newtons during a giant swing in gymnastics. So yes, the seal is an important factor to joint stability. The most simplified model and the model that is mostly used to explain the suction force is that of a vacuum seal. However, the real physics are slightly more complex. Imagine how hard it can be to separate two wet glasses from each other or consider how a glass of beer can appear blue to the table. The physics involved here is wet adhesion. The maths behind this model is way more complex. Yet a few things are important compared to the simple vacuum model. First of all, there is a time-dependent factor. The required forces decrease as progressively liquid bounds are breaking. So when applying traction, take your time. The overall force required will be less, as will be the risk for skin tears. Secondly, the importance of the available joint surface is quadratically higher than a simplified vacuum model. Be careful not to over trim the acetabulum, repair the torn labrum, as the available surface is extremely important for joint well being. A few words on the CAM resection. Although there is important evidence that thermostabular impingement, in particular CAM lesions, are related to hip OA, it remains hard to prove that a well performed CAM resection will avoid the occurrence of hip OA. Again, biomechanics can come to the rescue to evaluate the potential impact of hip arthroscopy. And so we did. We found that restoration of femoral sphericity, which is the key, femoral sphericity, comes with the normalization of the joint pressures. However, it lies as well a warning for hip dysplasia. When the femoral head or the acetabulum is not intrinsically spherical, 
reorientation of gas traveler will decrease the cartridge loading, yet it will never normalize. Final, a few quick thoughts on soft tissue management. And in particular, I would like to emphasize on the importance of the ligaments in the capsule. The capsule does not only impede the joint from reaching extreme position, it loads as a spring to assist in returning from these positions. In fact, the human body is tremendously energy efficient with 70% of energy cost for walking and running originating from elastic structures. As you all know, the strongest ligament of the body, the iliofemoral ligament, is part of the anterior capsule. We did stimulate its contribution to walking and found that it takes half of the effort of walking and running. Considering a large part of our patients are sportsmen that need physical endurance, we should respect the capsular ligaments and minimize our capsulotomy, not only for stability, but as well for maintaining physical endurance later on. So here are my, are my take home messages for this evening. Look at the bigger picture beyond the chem lesion, slowly on the traction, be meticulous on your cam takedown and respect the capsule. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Odenar. Um, let's move to the next talk. We go again uh, through the building up uh, hip, um, uh, topic. Please, Dr. Kanduha, um, go ahead with your presentation. Right, thank you, Oliver, and thank you, Mark, for the kind invitation. Uh, a bit of it, Femi has already mentioned in his talk, and we'll dwell on how do you build a hip arthroscopy team uh, and looking at training and post-op rehab. As we are well aware that hip arthroscopy has been steadily gaining a lot of popularity since the 1970s, the last decade has seen a significant amount of growth, and coupled with that, the introduction of femoral tablet impingement in the late 1990s meant that there was an explosive turn in the last decade, and both in terms of the numbers of procedures being done in hip arthroscopy as it's become the standard of care, and also the publications that are coming out in femoral stabular impingement. The indications, as you've seen and heard, have expanded as well, right from femoral stabular impingement to synovial abnormalities within the hip joint, and we're also now uh, exploring ex articular indications like the snapping hip, trochantric bursitis with gluteus medius stairs being repaired. The risk of complications is just about 3%. Uh, there is a steep and prolonged learning curve, as you've heard from Femi, and it's certainly not for the inexperience. And therefore, you need structured training for hip arthroscopy. And I'd probably think of it in three ways. You obviously need to master the technical skills. You most importantly need to understand the pathology and the biomechanics, as Manu has highlighted, and then the decision-making process in the outpatient clinic, which patients not to operate upon is probably the most important step. So assessment actually will begin in your young adult uh, with uh, hip pain in your outpatient clinic. You would request the appropriate investigations, interpret the investigations correctly, and finally make a decision of undertaking hip arthroscopy or not and then the nuances involved in each procedure. Therefore, you really need a multidisciplinary team to make or help you in this decision-making. So the core people in this team obviously would be you as the surgeon, a sports physician and a rheumatologist who would help you with all the inflammatory pathology, a radiologist who would help you with uh, the decision-making both in terms of the labral and articular cartilage pathology, which patients are not suitable for a hip arthroscopy and a physiotherapist. So that's your core team. But let's look at training then. If you divide training in hip arthroscopy, you can think of it in four ways. And we've done some work on this. I'll present that uh, towards the latter end of the talk. You need to be thinking about simulation training, uh, certainly a fellowship in young adult hip surgery, uh, cadaveric skills training, and finally mentored independent practice when you start off as a consultant. In terms of simulation training, there are enough number of studies to show that virtual reality training has really shown some improvement in technical skills. Adopting a, a proficiency-based program has also been shown to produce superior arthroscopic skills, but probably remains best 
at the earlier years of your training rather than towards the latter years. You certainly need some uh, amount of cadaveric skills training at that stage because there's a significant reduction in the total training time, at least in Europe, uh, from 30,000 hours to 6,000 hours uh, based on the European Working Time Directive. Surgical outcomes are certainly under public uh, scrutiny, and you need to be adequately trained in a specific procedure. And the CAD lab really allows you that feel uh, in a controlled environment to deal with a particular problem. The fellowship in young adult uh, hip surgery or hip arthroscopy is a must because it would bridge the gap in training. It would consolidate both your clinical and surgical skills. It's essential for gaining adequate clinical exposure and also improving surgical expertise. And hip arthroscopy, unfortunately, is still done in large numbers in only a few select centers. And surgeons in Europe, uh, both in Europe and UK now, uh, perform it only in these large centers. So I would certainly recommend that fellowships are done in these centers. And then once you've done that, traveling fellowships towards the end of your training would definitely be beneficial because you ex get experience from different centers of excellence, a different approach to a familiar problem, and then tips and tricks for each issue to deal with a complex problem. Finally, once you've taken on your own practice, you need some mentoring from a senior surgeon because setting up an independent practice can be stressful and your learning curve will continue to improve throughout your independent practice. There's poor evidence to quantify the number of cases, but as Femi said, about 30 cases to start feeling a bit confident and about 100, over 100 to become an expert. Now, this paper from Mark and his team actually lay out the pitfalls about preoperative, intraoperative and postoperative problems that you may encounter in hip arthroscopy. And your training and your team actually have to be built around this. So wrong patient selection, improper positioning is your preoperative issues. Intraoperative issues would be improper portal creation, damage to the intraarticular structures and related to traction time. And then finally, postoperative is all managing expectation and related to rehabilitation. And that's what you need to circumvent. Again, mentoring in independent practice helps with all these three problems uh, and your mentor could be taking you through that. It's also well known that the complications and the learning curve will improve as your numbers actually improve, both in terms of damage to the femoral head and articular cartilage, and also the nerve damage. So finally, you need to have a structured approach to learning and your team. You need a fellowship in young adult hip surgery. You need uh, cadaveric skills training, some sort of simulation training earlier on, and then a mentored independent practice. As you said, we've done some work on this and happy to share these two articles. And then from your base of your team, if you look at all these things in training, then your team expands to not only a sports physician, but a rheumatologist and pain specialist, obviously the radiologist, your physiotherapist who will look at prehab and rehab, your fellow and research fellow who will keep pouring in, both in terms of the clinical training and research training. A psychologist in the recent years I've found is very helpful. You need good admin support. Corporate support, whether it's Arthrex, Smith & Nephew, whichever company you work with, they will help you with the cadaveric training and also the new instruments. And finally, a network like this, an international network of hip colleagues that you can actually share cases with and discuss, be it a WhatsApp group or otherwise. And you really need a proper team. It is a team sport to get this running and have an effective practice. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Vikas. Wonderful, as always. Um, it's very clear that we need a, a, a huge uh, team in order to start properly to do that, uh, that surgery. Okay, we have the team, and now we need to prepare our operating room. Please, Dr. Tarsasender uh, from India, talk about this. Um, you can share the screen. The panel is yours. Good day, everyone, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity to talk about operating room setup and portals to successful hip arthroscopy. I'm Dr. Sasinda, Professor of Orthopedics from Puducherry, India. I shall be covering this topic under these subheadings, understanding patient positioning, understanding hip joint access, portals for successful hip arthroscopy, and finally, the learning points. We all know 
hepatoscopy has become very popular in the last decade the numbers have increased rapidly worldwide however there is a steep learning curve involved and it is not one for the inexperienced also the presence of various neurovascular structures has made it very important to understand the positioning and portal placement during hepatoscopy surgery it can be performed both in supine position and lateral decubitus position in the supine positioning the patient is on a fracture table with well padded uh, uh, boots and perineal post the non operative limb is maintained at 45 degrees the operative limb is initially maintained at 45 degrees of abduction the retraction internal rotation and then adduction in order to achieve both longitudinal and lateral traction and the so called vacuum stand the advantages of the supine position is the familiarity with the surgeon and the ease of use with a regular fracture table however it is easy, difficult to maneuver in the obese patient and there is decreased access to the posterior space lateral position is done with a specialized traction table and lateral decubitus positioning and padding the advantage is ease of use in obese patients and easier access to the posterior and inferior spaces however this longer positioning duration and special traction table is needed now moving on to the hip arthroscopy as per se we need to understand three regions in the in and around the hip joint that is the central compartment and the peripheral compartment divided by the acetabular labrum and also the extra articular compartment or the peritrochanteric space based on access to these areas the hip arthroscopy technique can be classified as the central compartment first peripheral compartment first or outside in technique in the central access or central compartment first technique the patient is under fluoroscopic guidance on a distraction fracture table direct access is first achieved into the central compartment of the hip joint and then subsequently the labrum can be seen or the whole joint can be visualized by going around the drawbacks of this technique is it takes longer time and hence a higher risk of neuropraxia with the traction there is risk of injury to the labrum or the cartilage in the peripheral access first technique access is first reached into the peripheral intra articular space under siam guidance and then the patient's thigh is taken into flexion to relax the anterior capsule and entry can be made into the central compartment the advantage includes lower risk to the labrum and the cartilage is easier and safer less traction time and less neuropraxia and useful when central access is difficult and finally we have the outside in technique where the access is first made to the anterior pericapsular region there is a capsulotomy that is done and then you enter into the peripheral compartment and into the central compartment the outside in technique has the advantage of being useful when there is addition in the joint however it is technically demanding extensive there can be a lot of fluid exacerbation and the risk of dislocation of the hip going on to the portals we have the anterolateral and the anterior portal the anterolateral portal is just 1 cm superior and medial to the greater trochanter whereas the anterior portal is 1 cm lateral to a line on the anterior superior iliac spine in the level of the anterolateral portal the mid anterior portal or a modified anterior portal is created with an equilateral triangle combining anterior and the anterolateral portal the distal anterolateral axillary portal is created with an isosceles triangle between the mid anterior portal and the anterolateral portal the proximal anterolateral axillary portal is at the junction of the medial one third and lateral two third of the line between the anterior superior iliac spine and the greater tuberous trochanter there is also a rectangular safe zone from the asas to 5 cm distal to the greater trochanter the most commonly used portals are the anterolateral and the mid anterior portal the anterolateral portal is directed 15 degrees posteriorly and cephalad from the landmark the portals this is a wonderful illustration showing the anterolateral distal anterolateral and anterior and posterolateral portal directly accessing into the central compartment and this one illustration of accessing the peripheral compartment all these portals can also be used to access the peritrochanteric space and then do a capsulotomy and finally your 
you have the access to the peripheral or the central compartment to proceed with your definitive surgery. So finally, the learning points are, there's a steep learning curve, ensure proper OR setup is achieved, sensitize the team on their positions, make a proper surgical plan based on accurate diagnosis, plan the portals preoperatively and keep help ready. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Sanser, for your presentation. Um, let's move to um, the last presentation. Uh, it's from do uh, Dr. Said from Egypt, and he will talk about arthroscopic, uh, the normal view and instruments uh, to better achieve our goal in hip arthroscopy. After that, we will have a small discussion about those uh, six books. Please, Dr. Said. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Oliver, for the invitation. Uh, thanks the speakers for the nice talk. So uh, how to start hip arthroscopy? You've heard about the positioning, the traction, the portals. I'm just going to give you uh, a note about the most important instruments and about the arthroscopic anatomy uh, inside. So, so we're going to talk about the instruments. I'm going to show you normal anatomy, but I'm also going to show you some abnormal anatomy so you know the difference. So these are the most important instruments. We start by the hip entry and you need uh, an arthroscopic hip needle with the trocar. You need a nitinol wire, a cannulated switching stick. And these are key instruments to start to enter the hip. And I also usually have a couple of non-cannulated switching sticks to switch between my portals. And one of the most important instruments is the slotted cannula or the half pipe in which you'll be able to get your instruments in and out. So this is a very, very important instrument. Once I started using in hip arthroscopy, now I'm using it in shoulder and knee arthroscopy. Then you have the specialized uh, instruments for like labor repair, which is either a specialized hip set or you can actually use your shoulder set if you don't have your uh, uh, initial hip set. So one of the most important things <clears throat> to me is the anatomy. Where are we? And I always think once I go into the hip, where are we? Are we anterior, lateral? Where are we exactly? So it's important to know. We usually describe the anatomy with the clock face. So the lateral point is the 12 o'clock. And that's when you're doing a supine position. Three o'clock is anterior. And then you have between one and two o'clock, you have the uh, subspinous area, which is usually enlarged. And then you have about three o'clock, you have the psoas. And then you have the medial synovial fold on uh, four o'clock or more medially. Most of the pathology that you will find in FAI is between 12 and three o'clock. So most of the cartilage lesions, the labral repair will, between, will be in that area. Less common, we are seeing lesions in postrolateral impingement at 11 o'clock and at 10 o'clock. So it's important once you go into the hip, I always start peripheral first. I look outside. I know where my anatomy is. I work on my cam. So I know that according to the anatomy and according to these pictures, I know where I am. So you see here the subspinous area, the psoas muscle on the front, and the medial synovial fold. So Dean's described a seven-point technique to look at the labrum. You can do it in any sequence you're comfortable with. I like to start with the labrum, paralabrum, sulcus. sulcus. I go medially on the uh, medial synovial fold. Then I look at the zona, the neck and the fat pad, the head the lateral fold on the cam, but I also look at the psoas. But then we added a couple of more steps that I think are also important in your routine examination, which is the dynamic femoroestabular impingement test. You need to look where the impingement is happening and you need to be probing your labrum to see, really see where the tear could be uh, from the outside, from the outside. So these, uh, uh, this is the anatomy we use. We use the lateral port, the uh, peripheral compartment, the proximal anterolateral, distal anterolateral, and anterolateral portals. This is the direction of the portals, as you've seen. I actually start with the distal anterolateral, and I use uh, for the camera, and then I switch between portals according to what's necessary. So once you go in, we are looking at the anterolateral part. Uh, because you went in from superior. So you look at the labrum, the paralabrum sulcus, you probe the labrum, you check if there is any uh, abnormal consistency, and I'll show you in the next slides. Then you start to go medially again, uh, looking at the joint medially. You take it back slightly to look at the neck. You observe the medial synovial fold, which is roughly at four o'clock. If we consider anterior is three o'clock, this is more anteromedial at four o'clock. That's the medial synovial fold. 
we come back, we see, we look at the fat pad on the in front of the neck, and then we look at the zona orbicularis, and then we start going uh, laterally. So this is a different case which shows you once you go laterally, you see the neck and you also see the cam at this stage. You can see this abnormal bump on the lateral part of the head and neck, which is the cam lesion. This is what you want to be resecting. Then uh, after you do your pathology, your cam, then you're going to be going to the central compartment. We look at the acetabular fossa. We have the ligamentum teres. Once you have good traction and you start by looking anterior, you have the psoas hue anterior, which is roughly almost at two, uh, between two and three o'clock. In this patient, he's got a small uh, ulcer or cyst. And you look at the labrum and you probe the labrum and the cartilage to look for pathologies. You look anterior, lateral, and posterior. So in this case, the posterior labrum is intact. The uh, psoas you actually, there was a small separation of the chondrolabral junction at this area. So there's the indentation is normal but that they're actually separated is abnormal. The more important feature that's very clear here is the chondral delamination. So this is very common between 12 and three o'clock with the FAI pathologies. And if you look at that again, it's an abnormal, the cartilage is delaminated and that gives you the wave sign. And this is when you start probing the labrum once you're inside, you're probing it and you can see that the cartilage is coming out, producing the wave sign or the delamination. And that's where your pathology is that's where you need to decompress your cam and the pincer in that area. These are abnormal things you can see. This is the dynamic testing I'm telling you about. You need to see where it's impinging. So I always do that before and at the end of the surgery. I look at the, um, uh, the labral bruising. You can see it tells you there's a problem here. It's either impingement or from the psoas. Sometimes you see it more anterior in relation to the psoas muscle. You can tell where the demarcation is and where the pathology is. Uh, this is an example, again, of the psoas muscle. You can see there's actually labral fraying uh, just under the psoas. In this case, we need to do uh, be releasing the psoas. Sometimes there is actual separation between the labrum and the cartilage. This is separation of chondrolabral junction. This is a worse lesion than the one we saw before. It also includes uh, some delamination. Other pathologies which you may see, such as calcification, this is something you will notice on the x-ray. It's a telltale sign. You have a labor problem. Uh, and this is a uh, calcific deposits, uh, which you'll need to excise uh, around the labrum before decompressing uh, your pincer. What's more common actually is the os acetabulum, uh, and you can see that, that that's why it can cause pain. We used to neglect these lesions. Actually, this is abnormal. It's an unstable pathology. We excise it with the excision of the pincer lesion. And this is the labral probing. Dean's described in this very nice paper a different uh, probing uh, effect. As you see, anterior, it's stable. As we go uh, downwards lateral, you see the labrum flipping. This is a, uh, a two plus flip in which there's a complete separation of the labrum. Uh, on the other hand, in which there's ossification, you'll see that the labrum is immobile. This is a very stiff labrum because of the, uh, uh, of the bone around it. So it's a flip test one uh, minus. Uh, some other uh, things you might notice is head indentation. In posterolateral impingement, we may see that. Uh, so sometimes you'll find these pathologies deep inside the head. Uh, you cannot decompress all the way into that. But these are different pathologies which you may look at. So in summary, I think it's very important once you go in to localize where your anatomy is, to realize where is 12 o'clock. You look at the subspinous area, look at the psoas, the synovial fold, determine where you are in the hip. And of course, you will need special instruments for the hip entry, the 70 degree lens and the shoulder or hip set, which will help you do the labor repair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Said. Um, we are out of time, so um, we will start now the discussion. But it's important to present also the, the case that we have been preparing. Case clinics will, will help us to understand better the limits. But we have time for a small discussion. Please, Oliver, there are some questions from the audience. Can you go ahead with those? And yes, please, everybody uh, can switch on the micro, so if you want to to participate in the discussion, feel free. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. There are some questions from the audience. So I will last, uh, just say a couple of them. One is related to diagnosis, and uh, they were asking about the role of arthro-MRI. Is that mandatory? 
we need to do uh, arthro MRI in that cases to assess the cartilage of the labral damage piece. Any 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 reply from Ahmed? You are on mute. Can you? You are mute, Ahmed. Any any reply from uh, Hatem? Uh, yeah, Oliver, actually, so it really depends on the quality of the MRI machine. If you have a three Tesla, I think you may not need an MRA, but in a lot of areas when it's only one and a half Tesla, the MRA is very useful. It picks up uh, more uh, pathology. And I think if you're starting hip arthroscopy, I would strongly recommend that you do MRAs because it will pick up the pathology. It will encourage you and the patient to proceed with the surgery. Great. Right. Any comment on that? Something yeah. you done? Yeah. Oliver, yeah. uh, may I recommend, it's not a matter of uh, arthrography only, it's a matter of the sequence of cuts. The radial oblique sequence, it's a must. Otherwise, you, if you do a normal sequences with an, with an arthrography, it doesn't differ. I, we cannot see the labral tears and the labral pathology quite well. You have to, to do the radial oblique sequence. Yeah, it's, it's a, good, quite a, good, a good point, Ahmed. Um, Sassindar, any, any comment in India? Do you use arthromorite? <laughs> Um, we usually have a higher threshold for uh, arthrogram uh, in most of the joints, including the hip. But um, um, I would agree with Ahmed to say uh, sensitizing even the radiographer to the appropriate plane of the cuts and the exact sequences is very, very important. Most of the time, we could we could go get away with uh, needing an arthrogram if our cuts are very good. That's great. Manu from Belgium, any comment on arthro MRI? Do you think it's useful? Maybe you prefer CT and 3D reconstruction, right? Um, we have quite some waiting lists locally on the uh, MRI. Uh, so if we are under pressure, we go for a CT scan and have a 3D view. But otherwise, if we have the opportunity, we would recommend the arthro MRI as well. Okay, great. Just Argentina, Latin America, that's quick reply. I almost never use an MRA. I, I, I do use a normal MRI with the three Tesla. Okay, great. And As we have to repeat several times, it's a matter of team building. So probably it's a discussion that you need to have in each center with your radiologist. What are the protocols that you are going to use? And the constant uh, follow up and feedback to and until you uh, really have the images that you need. There is another question, Mark, uh, from the audience. It comes from uh, India, so I will ask uh, Sasindar about that. They are asking about the indication of the uh, diagnostic hip arthroscopy. Do you think that hip arthroscopy is just for diagnosis, or actually with the current? image and, and clinical test, we can go to treat the pathology instead of do the diagnosis? Um, I think um, the term diagnostic arthroscopy is kind of obsolete at this point of time when we have very good investigation uh, MR-based techniques to identify the diagnosis. Most of the time, we are able to identify the problem and most of the time, the intervention has Surgical intervention has to be therapeutic, not diagnostic. Do you agree with that, Hatem? Uh, yes, I rarely, rarely we do uh, just uh, diagnostic arthroscopy. So it's most of the time we're going in, we know there's a problem and we're going to manage it. So I agree with that. Uh, it's only very, very rare that I've gone in not in knowing exactly what we're planning to do. Uh Mark, just one last question from the audience, and in that way we can finish the question from our our great audience. Um, Manu, there is a, a question from Colombia. Um, what do you think about the dynamic FII? What is that concept? I mean, uh, the question is about that, but I think FII always is a dynamic problem. What do you think about the static or dynamic FII? Um, Oliver, I, I, I think you're totally right in, uh, in calling uh, impingement a dynamic uh, pathology. I don't really see uh, where the static um, part comes in. Unless we, we, um, we did some studies on sitting, 
configurations and squatting. And, and for some, uh, for some cam lesions, sitting down 90 degrees uh, flexed can make the cam lesion intrude into the joint and give uh, rise to, to high stresses. Whether that's a cause of cartilage damage, I think the um, velocity to a mass is more important than the impact than a very silent position. That's my opinion. Yeah, I, I think that's correct. Clear. Uh, do you have any okay. questions? Our panel. Oliver, yeah. in, in order to be on time, um, we have a couple of uh, clinical cases that it will be wonderful to discuss, and we can extend the discussion with the presentation of the clinical cases. So uh, we will start with the, our first one. It's how much degenerative change is too much. You know that um, cartilage lesion and hip arthrosis is on the on the limits of hip arthroscopy of any hip preserving surgery. So please, uh, um, Dr. Ahmed, uh, can you introduce that topic uh, with that pre uh, case presentation, please? Yeah. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Ahmed Abdel Azim, professor of orthopedics in Cairo University. Uh, I will share with you, I will go just for the first slide. This is <clears throat> the x-rays. Uh, of a female, she's 20 years uh, years old. When I saw her for the first time, uh, she works as a makeup artist. Uh, she has a perfect body mass index, 25. She's not athletic, but she she used to play sports, especially basketball, since uh, childhood. Uh, since two years after getting married, she started feeling some pain with, especially with sports, and she shifted from regular basketball uh, ball player to uh, light sports like running and jogging. However, now she cannot do any sports on a regular basis. That's her x-rays. That is the hip x-ray together with the MR arthrography. And this is the CT scan together with the three-dimensional reconstruction. So I'll go back again. She's a 20 years female. She's body mass index 25, right hip pain since two years. She shifted from regular sports. Now she's not able to do, except some light sports on an occasional manner. This is the MR arthrography. And this is the CT scan. Okay, so... Oliver, please, this is the first question. What is your advice? What will you do for her after seeing the x-rays, the MR arthrography, the CT scan? Will you go yeah. for a... Yeah, will you recommend physical therapy or lifestyle modification? Encourage her to do a hip arthroscopy or an open joint preservation surgery or just wait for a total hip? Yes, we can do a poll and get the get the opinion from the audience. That's important. So please vote on your uh, platform, your your pioneer secret pioneer platform, and then you can we can see your opinion about these four questions that uh, that we can see here from from Ahmed. I think it's a great case, Ahmed, and very complex to decide in a very young lady. But first of all, we should do what is the diagnosis in this case. So uh, we are waiting for the re reply from the audience. So uh, Manu, do you think it's uh, a clear case of FII or what do you think about this anatomy in this case? I think it's a complex case to decide indeed. Um, it's a deep socket. Um, there is a cam or an osteophyte rather than cam. Um, yeah, yeah. I, it's I, a agree. Case. I agree. I agree. <laughs> I agree with you, but the but the audience is, are so motivated with the with the surgery. They decide keep arthroscopy in sixty five percent. So they are they are very you know happy so, to do surgery here, Ahmed. So uh, Oliver, yeah. let's let's take them for the second question. So most of them they decided to go for a preservation surgery, especially hip arthroscopy. So what is the reason behind your recommendation? Now we are faced with a complex case. She has osteoarthritis. She's starting to get osteophytes, joint narrowing. 
So what's the, re the reason or the, 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 the philosophy behind the recommendations that you will go for a hip arthroscopy uh, or preservation yeah. surgery? Is, there, okay. is that her, pay, her age is 28, joint space, or the outer bridge cartilage lesions by the MR arthrography, or the absence of excess osteophytes, she has limited osteophytes and cystic lesion, or the osteoarthritic, osteoarthritis grade, or others? Okay, let's see what audience said, and uh, while we can uh, do our opinion. So, um, Sassindar, I mean, uh, uh, do you have a, a real diagnosis in this case? Do, do you think it's a clear FIA as we asked to Manu? Um, I don't think this is a clear cut of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, there's no cap. I feel it is more of a global over coverage issue. There is a pincer kind of FA, but that has uh, secondarily also led to uh, formation of cam osteophyte on the femur. Okay, uh, so our our audience can see the result. Yeah, Mark. I mean, just just to say that the results from the audience are also very surprising. I mean, most of the audience, seven seventy percent, thinks that we have to do a hip arthroscopy because the patient is very young, because the patient's age. Wow, amazing. Uh, what do you think, Mark? And I, I think that this is a very common mistake uh, to do the indication based on the age of the patient, but not on the diagnosis of the patient. Uh, Manu started saying that he has doubts if that is a cam lesion or is an osteophyte. Um, at the very beginning, you can see any an aspherisity as a cam lesion because you want to to see a cam lesion. But please, uh, Mahatem, can you comment the uh, the images that you can see? What do you think that we have here? This is a cam morphology or this is an osteophyte um, that it's a reaction bone and it's not something that you can trade with hypertroscopy. What do you think? Uh, Mark, think, I think obviously to me, I mean, this could be an osteophyte the, on the head, uh, but you have what's more striking to me is the pincer. There is obviously over coverage of the head, uh, especially in the posterior part, posterolateral part. So this is definitely, uh, there is an element of FAI here. So I, the acetabular part, I don't think it's an osteophyte, but on the femoral side, yes, this is uh, this is early OA. And uh, again, uh, Hatton, do you think age is your critical point to decide hip arthroscopy or not in this case? Well, it, it, it is one of the factors for sure to decide. I mean, if this patient is 60, you would be thinking in something different. So it, that's always the controversy in osteoarthritis. So I think the same degree of early OA in a young patient would push you towards arthroscopy. In an elderly patient, you would not even consider arthroscopy. So the age yeah. is a factor, but as Mark said, if, if you have too advanced OA in a young patient, you're not going to do it. So it's really those middle grades that you're considering. The younger the patient is, the early, then you can go slightly higher with the osteoarthritis. The higher the age, then it's very little osteoarthritis that you'd accept to do hip arthroscopy. That's, that's, a, that's a very interesting point, Hatton. There are very recent reports in the literature that said that age is not a key factor for complication or, or, or worse results. It's a very nice paper uh, from the US that said that the main and only factor that affect the result, the clinical results of this patient after hip arthroscopy is the cartilage damage. And that's mean that point two in this question, joint space, point three, outer bridge cartilage damage, and point five, osteoarthritis grade are the main risk factor if we if we follow this paper, so uh, not sure. Just, so, Oliver, let's take the audience to the third to the third question. So they decided to make an operation, and they are up to it. What will you promise the patient? This is a young patient. She's asking for somehow to return to normal life. Will you promise her a full recovery, a major improvement, a minor improvement? No improvement at all, but you are promising her that this will stop the deterioration, or we will not do it. Wow. Ahmed, great questions. Let's see what people said, but you know... I mean, want these to are the better. questions that we always face in these situations. <laughs> so, uh, Manu, 
any comment on that about what the expectation of the patient should um, you know know in this case? Pablo, you wanted to add something? Oh. Yes, yeah. thank you. Pablo, sorry. So I think we're, we're missing a few things here. The most important one is range of motion to indicate the preservation surgery. I mean, we need a hip that moves. If it's okay. really limited, I would, I would doubt considering a hip arthroscopy. Uh, and secondly, regarding osteophytes, I recommend the paper from Bern. The first author is Hanke, and it talks about which are the worst the worst osteophytes predicting failure following hip arthroscopy at 10-year follow-up. And uh, the, the conclusion is that we should pay attention to the fossa. And the fossa here is not shown, but occlusion of the fossa, which would mean a, a, a central osteophyte, would jeopardize the indication of a preservation surgery. And the other one is the, uh, the intra intraosseous cyst at the weight-bearing area of the acetabulum. I mean, the, 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 the osteophyte at the head, at the femoral head, uh, would, would, wouldn't be a contraindication to treat this pincer, which to me requires open surgery, if any, would require control dislocation, if any surgery. So it's amazing. Let, let's see, let's see, because, because we are discussing what are the main risk factors for a failure in this 28-year-old woman. Uh, and we were discussing that age is one of the important factors. It's a very young patient and they need a hip arthroscopy. We are talking about the fossa. We are talking about the range of motion, as mentioned, Pablo, that is our important factor. What do you think the most important factor to predict any failure in this 28-year-old woman with these x-rays with some osteoarthritis? Do you do a hip arthroscopy here? What are the risk factors? What do we have to explain the patient about the outcomes and expectations? Uh, yeah, so uh, in in my books, uh, we we've, we've done actually four papers on this. Um, I've got a PhD student working on this as well. In my books, the first thing would be that if there is a reduced joint space narrowing, which this patient has, uh, this patient has uh, got poor prognosis after any any kind of a preservation surgery. That's number one. Number two is if the patient has got bone edema and cysts, then those patients do badly uh, as well. The good thing is on his side or on her side, you've got age, but uh, I would certainly be very reluctant to offer this patient uh, any kind of a preservation surgery. Now, we've done two systematic reviews, one looking at the outcomes of uh, hip preservation in patients with tonus 2 and above. Those patients certainly don't do well following arthroscopic intervention, and the rates for conversion to total hip arthroplasty are very high. And secondly, the higher the outer bridge grade at hip arthroscopy, the more the chances of reoperation and the more the chances of conversion to a total hip replacement. So those two, having said that, uh, there is inconclusive evidence because there is a there are a couple of series from the US, especially which show ten year data uh, with some arthritis and these patients improving. So what we need in the longer term or in the medium term is. Uh, a randomized control trial, especially for the younger patients. But as soon as they go above 40 and they have this kind of arthritic picture, then uh, they do not do well with hip preservation, even in the medium term. So because you, your opinion is, is opposite than the audience, let's see, Ahmed, how do you feel in this case? <laughs> so uh, I can see that 70% uh, uh, they promised major improvement, and this is astonishing. So this is the central compartment. I usually start central first, distraction of the hip. I checked the head. The head is perfect cartilage. I, I checked the central part of the hyaline cartilage. It's fine. The peripheral part shows some delamination or cartilage degeneration the, uh, uh, at the anterolateral part uh, of the hip. You can see the labral changes with, with some cystic changes uh, and degenerative changes together with degenerative changes in the peripheral hyaline cartilage. Okay, so this is the central compartment. What's your plan of treatment after seeing this good hyaline cartilage? So we don't have too, too much time, please go forward. Okay, so, so I will, I, I, so the plan 
is to either to think about a stabular recession, labor repair or debridement or reconstruction, or to do high line cartilage debridement together with labral repair or debridement or reconstruction. So I will show you what I did. So I decided first to, I thought first of uh, labral repair and, uh, and I checked. So I, in this view, I changed the portals. I started getting uh, a space between the labrum and the cartilage, creating the space and then passing a loop suture around the labrum so as to check its uh, co uh, continuity. And then I shifted the loop suture from the lateral porter to the anterior porter. And once I shifted to the anterior porter, I found it cutting through the labrum. This was the view when I just passed the suture from the, lat from the lateral porter to the anterior portal. So it's a very weak labrum. It's totally degenerated. And I always uh, debride this type of labrum because I'm afraid that the symptoms persist, especially the pain after repairing such a degenerated labrum. So I started uh, debridement, labrum debridement, together with acetabular recession till I have a stable uh, cartilage, a uh, high line cartilage. So... I will, I, I'm working through the anterior portal, and that's the checking the depth of the acetabulum after uh, uh, acetabular recession till a, a good high line cartilage. And I di uh, I discovered, uh, or at finally, uh, we uh, recessed the acetabulum by about 20%. So that's the final video after doing labral debridement and acetabular recession. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. And so finally, you could see uh, that as an expert, it is very difficult to trade those cases. Um, but the main thing is that uh, the pool was thinking about uh, uh, arthroscopy as the main indication in that patient, 65%. But all the panel conclude that probably it's out of the indication. So I think that the main message is be very careful when you are considering hip arthrosis. Um, you should not be considering it according to the age, but according to the images that you really have. Because as we can see, even with an expert, it's sometimes difficult to manage those hips. And the results in the long term, for sure, they are not going to be as brilliant as we want it to be. I, I think agree. it can be a conclusion. Yeah, I agree, Mark. Just one last comment from Vikas, because he was the chair of the 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 first uh, uh, register of uh, preserving surgery because what are the results in this young patient that you do a resection of the labrum and resection of the of the of the acetabular rim uh, what is the long term or short term uh, clinical results with that patient so certainly uh, in our registry data of over 5000 patients the label repair patients do much better in terms of uh, scb over a medium term uh, as compared to labral debridement. I'm still of the opinion that uh, with such amount of uh, joint space narrowing, uh, these patients should not be offered hip preservation because we will not be able to give them long-term uh, good outcomes. Okay, thank you. Let's move to the next case. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Okay, Pablo, please share your screen. Can you stop sharing the screen, Ahmed? Yeah. And then we will move to the other um, borderline indication, to the other uh, pathology that we should consider when we are um, starting our hip arthroscopy is that it's the presence of dysplasia uh, in those patients. I think that those will be the most important topics, the limits because of the cartilage lesion, the limits because of a non-considerate or non-enough uh, considerate dysplasia. Please, Pablo. Thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mark. I hope I have time uh, for this discussion. I have nothing to disclose, rather that I, I do both uh, hip arthroscopy and uh, open surgery as well. Uh, and here goes the case. Uh, this is a 22-year-old female medical student who practices acrobatic dance with right hip pain. 
She is on uh, psychiatric medication, and he has under she has undergone a hip arthroscopy one year ago due to apparently hip impingement. Upon physical examination, she's got a hundred degrees of flexion, thirty five of internal rotation, forty five external rotation, abduction forty five. And she has pain almost on any provocative test, fat ear, flexion, abduction, external rotation, abduction, external rotation, and, and my um, apprehension test, which is uh, abduction, hyperextension, external rotation. And my apparent uh, feeling of uh, version is upon the Craig test is 20 degrees. And this is the, uh, these are her x-rays, which I usually use both. Uh, supine and standing AP pelvis x-rays, a Lacan view and uh, 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 done lateral view. It's uh, just the uh, standing AP pelvis. I did some uh, measurements so that you can see. Mm. Here, the lateral center edge angle is what many surgeons called borderline, which is between 18 to 25, 20 to 24, 20 to 25, the varies among the literature. The asteroid index is six degrees. The anterior wall index is 0.23. Uh, the posterior wall index is 1.1. The anterior center edge angle is 35, and I see no cam lesion on the lateral view. So to, to the audience, Paul, my first question would be, and to anyone who wishes to participate, what radiographs are best to study a painful hip in the young adult uh, with those options. And uh, I call into question uh, this agreement, which was uh, performed for FAI, not for hip dysplasia, uh, which uh, suggests using an AP pelvis without saying which AP pelvis, whether supine or standing. And uh, they suggest also, which many authors of this uh, agreement are here in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, webinar today so that everybody can participate. And uh, the recommended lateral view is the done lateral view. There's no mention of any false profile view. And uh, I, I bring it to question the supine and standing because there's uh, plenty of evidence suggesting that uh, a supine X-ray may overlook, overlook uh, anterior wall coverage. Thank you. Let's see what audience uh, are going to vote. But in the meantime, yeah. Uh, any comment, Manu, about the biomechanics of the dysplasia in that case, different than FII? Uh, since uh, about three months, we now have a standing CT scan cone beam. So I would um, I'm very interested in what these cases will give on a standing CT scan. That's um, so. I will answer that next year, Oliver. It's amazing. A standing CT scan. Let's see. Thank you. We, we, we are struggling with a standing AP X-ray. He's got a standing CT scan. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. So let's see the voting. I mean, 50% of the audience said AP pelvis, done lateral view and false profile. And uh, 36, a standing and supine AP pelvis. They are asking uh, with this that question. And done lateral view plus false profile. So please go ahead. So I'll, I'll go. I'll go with this. This is just a recently accepted paper that uh, we will publish next uh, in the American Journal of Sports Medicine, in which we suggest avoiding the use of a Lekin or a false profile view to assess anterior wall coverage because it does not uh, accurately correlate with the hip to norm anterior wall coverage or the or the anterior acetabular sector angle at three o'clock, and that better correlates with uh, the measurement of the anterior wall index described by Steven Rock and colleagues. And you can see a difference in the curves, which is uh, more flat, the one uh, uh, the, um, with the anterior center edge angle and uh, with a better correlation, positive correlation, the one with the acetabular index. So I do both supine and standing uh, X-rays, AP pelvis, uh, besides the, the done lateral view. And uh, I also highlight the fact that we should pay attention with a hawk eye to indirect signs of uh, instability or dysplasia, such as this one described by uh, Omar Maidang and uh, Wong, which is the um, uh, upsloping of the lateral source seal, which uh, it is sometimes underestimated and that this patient uh, has bilaterally. So let's see uh, what is the comment uh, about that, Sassender. 
Do you think these AP views, standing or whatever, are you know the key of the diagnosis, or are more a three D uh, approach to these dysplasia patients? Um, I'm sorry, uh, I do not have a lot of experience in dysplasia, so I would ask Pablo to okay. address on this. Uh, Manu, Manu, do you have some some papers and some investigation or, or research about that? Do you think in dysplasia is just much better to a 3D view than a 2D view? We don't have any papers on that. Um, um, in terms of surgery, me neither. Um, I'm an experienced uh, dysplasia surgeon, so I'm going to give uh, someone else this question. Uh, or... okay, let's go, Pablo. Go ahead. <laughs> so I, I, I do both. I do... Uh... X-rays, of course, and CT and MRI. I do both, and we're, we're carrying a, a, a research on these. And uh, what we measure usually on the CT scan, besides taking a qualitative view of the if the anterior wall coverage is uh, lacking or uh, is overestimated, we calculate the anterior stabular sector angle at different uh, levels, which is the equatorial level, which means at the center of rotation, at an intermediate level, and that. Uh, why, why we do this? We, this has been uh, pre previously described by Stephen Anda and colleagues in 1986, and we further studied this with the Washington University of St. Louis uh, uh, surgeons with Cecilia Pacual Garrido and, and, and the group of John Cloisi, and we've seen that, the, especially the proximal anterior stellar sector angle, uh, correlates with uh, wall coverage, with uh, the efficient wall coverage, this set at... Uh, 120 degrees, uh, the, the measurement of the wall coverage, which you see there, how, how it is measured. It is simple, simply measured at a bilateral axial view of both uh, hips, and you should take uh, into uh, measurement, I mean, the, both center of rotations and the most anterior and most posterior aspects of the, of the walls. And uh, equatorial and proximal levels of these measurements help the surgeon understand if there is any bone lacking in, in those uh, areas. So it is interesting to uh, delineate between normal and uh, dysplastic acetabulum. Oh, it's great, Pablo, but we have only two minutes. So go to okay, the side. Okay. So uh, I, I've seen also uh, some uh, findings on the, on the MRI. I, I detected uh, a labral, a paralabral cyst at three o'clock besides uh, uh, Degeneration at 12 o'clock and the tear and the ligamentum teres and uh, go over this. Uh, uh, skip, skip that question, please. Go to the treatment. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my treatment was a combined hip arthroscopy and periastabular osteotomy. I found first uh, at, the, at the scope uh, a lesion at the two or three o'clock area, which is almost where your mid anterior portal is performed. So it is really anterior uh, area of the labral. Uh, uh, um, damage and also uh, she had more laterally at 12 o'clock the osteochondral lesion and also a bit more centrally which was compatible with what we, with what we see at the MRI and afterwards I, I performed uh, a PAO on another table and this is the radiographic result and the comparative result I provided a bit more lateral coverage and uh, of course more anterior coverage and this is the patient uh, over time at 50 post-operative days. Um, maybe uh, the, the, there is a big difference uh, between the, the, this uh, X-ray and the post-operative one, uh, in which the anterior coverage seems to be a bit uh, more overcovered. But uh, she's doing fine, and she's uh, walking unassisted at, at, at 50 days. Great, great results. Had them so, any well, well, yeah, so my, my, my final message is, as, is that there is no universal classification for, for hip dysplasia, but I know it can exist in the range of 20 to 25 degrees and even beyond. Paul Bollet and colleagues have described uh, the presence of purely anterior uh, deficient uh, hips, which should be treated with uh, periastabular osteotomy. I believe a physical exam is crucial to discard impingement. And the PAO with or without scope is my gold standard for treatment of these cases. Adam, any comment, Ambikas? Um, just one one question, actually, because at the end of each scope, I mean, if you do a labor repair, usually the end, the hip is quite swollen. Uh, is it easy to proceed to a PAO after that, or do you do them as uh, different sittings? 
No, I mean, it, it is uh, more difficult to me to find or to delineate my second window when I uh, open the, the fascia over the tensor. There's a lot of fluid at that, uh, at that time, uh, but there's no issues with the, with the first window. Uh, but the second window is a bit more juicy uh, but at the beginning, only at the beginning. Because do you choose two stage, one stage? Yeah, just just two comments, uh, Oliver. One is that uh, you definitely need three-dimensional imaging and we use a CT scan because you will not pick up anterior dysplasia otherwise. So all these patients get a CT scan. Secondly, you will not be able to measure what their antiversion is if you don't get that with the knee. So that's one point. And the second point is that we've done uh, another systematic review on this, looked at borderline dysplasia and hip arthroscopy. And the three groups of patients who do not do well following hip arthroscopy are the ones with excessive antiversion over 20 degrees, are the ones with an anterior deficient wall, and essentially age above the age of 40. So those are the three poor prognostic factors for hip arthroscopy and borderline dysplasia in over 1,500 patients in this systematic review. So just do those two points. So I think the, the, the reason why the hip arthroscopy failed was essentially it was anterior dysplasia, which is what the systematic review was showing. So I think this treatment is absolutely perfect. I'm not so sure about the value of scoping the hip. Um, I would have probably gone for a PAO directly. Okay, thanks, Vikas. So can you stop sharing the screen, Pablo, because... Uh, then uh, thank you so much for all your comments, guys. Uh, time is running out. So, um, Mark, can you do a summary of the... Okay, I don't, I don't know if we have too many time for, for the summary, but if you have any final uh, comment that you want to do, otherwise I will uh, share with you the screen and I will um, give you my, my opinion on, on that webinar. Any comments yeah. as a final comment? Okay, then I go ahead. Um, thank you to all the panel. It has been a, a nice webinar, and I think that we have um, defined the the how to start the, with hip arthroscopy. And as you can see, it is not an easy thing. And there has been a lot of talks. And finally, um, we know that uh, history is very important. From uh, Yeni, I will get that word: uh, growing pain. If be careful, because patients don't say I have growing pain. They usually say I have hip pain and you must be sure what they are talking about. The injection tests are a good tool. You must always consider them. And he started introducing the team-based work. Um, without the nerve, we saw that he, we must remember always biomechanics. It's not just uh, an, a matter of hip anatomy, but we should consider hip uh, biomechanics. And we need to understand what is the labral suction and how important it's to restore the labral suction, not just to, um, to achieve a proper alpha angle, but to restore a proper uh, labral suction. Um, from the talk from, uh, from Vikas, I think that the most important uh, summary is that you do not have to start alone. Even if you don't have to start with a good colleague, we need a, a huge team it's not just the radiologist, but you saw that there is a huge team that you, you, you need to start properly hip arthroscopy. Um, we know from St. Cinder that you need special needs for hip scope and, and the setting of your operating room is it's important. Uh, traction is a very sensitive point. There are different strategies for dealing with it, but you should always consider them. Um, and from Said, you said that you saw that there are different approaches according to your preference or according to the to the uh, special conditions of your patient. But you need always specific instrument for hypertroscopy. Uh, and from Ahmed, the, the case you saw, uh, be careful. Don't press, don't promise too much false expectations. Those are cases. Just for uh, uh, very scheduled surgeons, be careful with degenerative change. With any single degenerative change, be very careful, especially at the beginning. And from Pablo, you saw that it can be very complicated to define what's this plus. It's not just an, a, a, a deeper angle. It's a, it's a huge condition that depends on different angles, but also um, on the uh, exploration of the patient. Be very careful with those cases. Well, I think that it has been a nice uh, webinar here. You can 
you can uh, fulfill that uh, survey. Um, and I will invite all the all the people to to get that uh, um, and to to go ahead with that. And for the last, I would like to invite you to na our next uh, webinars in Seacode about um, that from uh, from uh, hip uh, from open uh, hip preservant surgery how we properly. And then we will have some about education, uh, education methods in orthopedics. It will be very interesting in April. And then from uh, rehabilitation and advances in prosthetic also in April. And finally, we will have our secret Congress in, in Cairo uh, next November, where I hope we will see face-to-face -face all of us. Um, and thank you, every, thank you very much to thank everybody. You. I think that uh, we are really out of time. If you have any comment uh, to say goodbye, Oliver, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your great effort. Thank you for the audience all around the world. Again, more than 500 people registered for this webinar. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for the effort to the speakers from all around the world, uh, from India to, uh, to, to Buenos Aires. So sounds sounds great to meet you here again. And please come to our next HIP webinar in a little bit more than two weeks, open surgery in preserving uh, these HIPs. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.